it's exciting because that means that someone back in the ancient times understood that splitting the atom was the start of all life. Who? Who was it that knew that? Diana, you see how I'm a. Ah, so. Things are getting busy at the children's home. We've got uh, four cerebral palsy children now, um, all with varying degrees of uh, disability. So like Johan is completely incapable uh, of doing anything for himself. Esther is as well. Um, as is Christina. But Diana is capable of learning. We've discovered today because she's learned to wipe her mouth um, when she's uh, drooling. So and she's starting to uh, do a lot more supported walking. So there's big hopes for her and for Esther when she gets older. Esther's only three at the moment, so I'm trying to get out the way of the wind. Uh, so I think I might, I think I can feel amusing coming on. This is our, uh, sorry, <laughs> this is our mural wall. I think I can feel amusing coming on. I've been having something on my mind for a few days. So, what I want to talk about is something that happened to me the other day. I had a man talking to me about Adam and Eve. And he was talking to me about how women are created from the rib of Adam and all this stuff. And you know, for me, I find it really strange that intelligent, mature humans can believe that there was a talking snake, for starters, in the Garden of Eden. Snakes don't talk. It's, it's, snakes do not talk. They just don't talk. It's, you know, it's the same as if I said to you, you have Greek mythology, if I said to you, there's a woman with snakes for hair, and when she looks at you, she turns you to stone. Did that happen? They'd say, no, it's a myth. Why, why do we switch that off when we look at texts like the Bible? Why do we think it's real? And the thing is, it ruins it. It ruins the magic of that story. When you tell somebody, when you tell somebody that there was a talking snake and a man and a woman and, and God has punished everybody based on the actions of that man and woman from that day forward. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. And it's because it's not a literal story. So the book of Genesis is the book of genetics. This is what it's about, and this is why it's exciting. It's exciting that these scriptures exist because they show you that there's something a lot more to human history than what we've been allowed to know or what we've realized. So Adam and Eve is an allegory for the start of all life, the splitting of the atom. Adam is the atom. Eve is the electron you remove from the atom and life begins from there. And as conscious life begins in the human form, decision-making begins as well. So you can choose right and you can choose wrong. You can go either side of the spectrum. And it's evident. You can't eat a piece of fruit and then become spiritually wicked because of some literal physical fruit. And Jesus told you that in the Bible. He said, he said, regarding the food you put in you, they come out in the draft so they don't affect your spiritual self. It's the stuff that comes from your mouth that causes the problem. And this is true to some degree, um, unless the stuff you're putting in is alcohol and stuff, which is what was spoke about, uh, which he spoke about. No glutton nor drunkard shall enter the kingdom of heaven. Because the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, 
is not somewhere you go when you die. That's what the church told you. Jesus told you it's here, it's within you. It's within you. So it's exciting, Adam and Eve, the splitting of the atom. To remove the electron from the atom is the start of all life. And this is brought on from the creation stories of ancient, ancient Egypt. So Adam takes his name from, from the, the ancient Egyptian story of a tomb. And the tomb is the God that manifests himself from the vast black consciousness. And uh, a tomb, he, he, took, he took his phallus and he masturbated and he had two children because Atum was androgynous, he was sexless, he was male and female. And until ancient Rome, God's name in the Bible was always Elohim, and Elohim means masculine feminine. This is where the name Adam stems from. It stems from that story in ancient Egypt. It stems from Atum. This is where the name came from. We know this is how biblical names work. That's why there's no people called John and Paul and stuff in the area that is Israel on the planet. We know that these names are adapted. So Adam is Atom. And if you struggle to understand how ancient Egyptian religions influenced uh, Christianity, then you just need to take a breather, take a step back, because at the end of every prayer you say Amen, which is Amen Ra, the Egyptian sun god. So it's exciting because that means that someone back in the ancient times understood that splitting the atom was the start of all life. Who? Who was it that knew that? Who was it that put this into mysticism? Who did that? So it's, it's exciting stuff. I mean, who knew this stuff? Who knew this information? Who was it? If you look at the tribe of Judah in the Bible, for example, it's a prime example, the, prime, the tribe of Judah. And they always face the yeast, and yeast is a uh, reference to facing the right side, the right hemisphere, facing the light. Many people refer to the tribe of Judah as the tribe of light. In Numbers 2.9, I think it is. Numbers 2.9 and 9.2. Numbers, Numbers 2.9. And it tells you and you can reference this as, as many scribes do as the tribe of light. But it tells you their numbers was 186,400. And for those of you with no knowledge on physics, that's the speed of light. It's the speed of light. Who knew the speed of light when they were writing these allegories? Who was it? Who was it? And this is the magic that's been missed. How has it been seen and hidden? That's the question. So the tribe of Judah, the tribe of light, just so happened to contain the same amount of members as the speed of light. It's no mistake. It's hidden messages. Hidden, stunning messages that tell you so much about your history. That in history, there was knowledge so advanced that it's been missed now but it's there for us to see but only if you go within if you go within and you alter your consciousness you raise yourself up to the esoteric levels of consciousness which are air and fire or if you alter your mind to operate in theater you can begin to understand this you can begin to understand the mysticism and in there you can start to understand that there's a magic to life that religion is not helping you with it's not serving you it's not giving you the magic it's not telling you that in history men and women had advanced scientific knowledge that we can't possibly understand how they had it how did they know you had six cerebrum on either side of your brain when they wrote the allegory of the uh, ark of the covenant with the six cherubim angels how did they know and this is why I love the allegories of the Bible, because it opens up your mind to the realization that in our ancient of history, there were people with epic, epic scientific knowledge. Epic scientific knowledge. So who were they and where was their knowledge coming from? This is why I love the allegories and the interpretations of scriptures like the Bhagavad Gita, the Bible, and others. 
the dharmas as well because there's an esoteric mysticism that conveys a deep deep truth a deep truth and it's a deep truth that i feel might have been hidden by the powers that be including the religious institutions that everyone is worshiping with uh, in their pursuit for finding God. These institutions that pull you outside of yourself instead of inside of yourself. They must know what I know. There's no way they don't. And this is the funny thing about truth. We all know something about truth. There can only be one truth. There can only be one. There's only one true truth on the planet in reality. But we have many religions. And we have many people saying many different things. So that either means that many people are mistaken, many religions are mistaken, or many people in many religions are lying because they know the truth and they wish to conceal it. There can only be one truth. This is why religion has flaws. If you do as religious, if you do as the spiritual teachers that religion built itself around taught, you will find the truth and it's always to go within yourself. The Bhagavad Gita tells you of the battle between the left and right hemisphere and how Krishna rides through the middle to bring understanding. He rides in his chariot with a white horse. And that's an allegory that represents bringing understanding. I'll touch on that, the meaning of the word horse in historic, in esoteric mysticism. Uh, horse means understanding and white means pure. This is the language of esoterics. This is the beauty of it. If you know the language, then you can see everything that is hidden. So the core of religion is about overcoming the self, every single one of them. It's about going within, finding the pure understanding. It's not about screaming to the sky for people to come and fix it for you. Jesus will not ride through the clouds on a white horse, as it says in the Bible, because uh, as I've just said in esoterics, the white horse means pure understanding. You will meet Christ in the air because you will raise your consciousness to the level in esoterics, earth, water, air, fire, new mind. You will raise yourself up to air where there is no thought and there you will find Christ. This is the one truth of religion. And as I say, there's only one truth. That's an obvious observation for us all. And if we can accept that there's only one truth, then we can accept that religions are making mistakes because there are many religions and they're all pointing people externally in different directions. But if you find out the true meaning of the scriptures of these religions, they don't tell you to go outside of yourself. They don't tell you to look outside of yourself. They tell you to go inside. They tell you inside is where you'll find God. That's that's what we all need. That's what we all need. So we can find the present moment. So we can be aware and observe. And then we can go into the present moment. And then if everyone goes into the present moment, into the only now, into the only truth that there is, then when other people have entered into that moment and touched on that energy and then have made a decision to either go with the good or the evil, to either deceive, to, to, to help or deceive. And if they've chose to deceive, then you can't be deceived when you go within and you come to that real truth. People can't do it to you. They can try all they want. But if you're awakened and fully aware of the current present moment, there is only one truth and one reality and you will see the one truth and one reality. But only if you go within. You can look outside yourself all you want. You won't find it. But if you go within and you train your body and you open your mind and your heart to that present moment. You can't be deceived. So if anyone on the planet wishes to try and manipulate you within that present moment, they can't do it because you see it. You see what they're doing. And you say, no, it stops here. I'm not someone you can do that to. And I'm not willing to watch people I know and love have that done to them. But if you want to stand up against people doing that, you've got to go inside yourself. You've got to stop calling out to the sky for someone to come and fix it for you. If you want Christ, then find the Christ inside yourself. Find the kingdom of God inside you, because that is what Christ taught you to do. That is what Krishna told you to do, is what Buddha told you to do. These are all avatars of God, they're all his children. They came at different times with different messages. And they have similarities, as I've shown. 
Jesus comes through the clouds on a white horse. Krishna rides through the middle of the battle on a, a chariot pulled by a white horse. Because they come with pure understanding. And with pure understanding, you are free, you are saved, you are with God, and you cannot be deceived, and you cannot be misled. This is the magic of it. This is the magic of it. If people will learn esoterics, or if they want to hear from me and let it spark something so they go off and learn esoterics, then let them learn it from me. But if you want to hear me and learn it, you must go away and go inside yourself or you're wasting your time listening to me. Because if you learn this and go inside yourself and do as these gurus taught, do as what Yeshua taught, as what Buddha taught, as what Krishna left, the messages they left behind, if you do it, you will come to the same view as what I have, as what many other people have. And you will see the other information I'm sharing without any effort. You won't need to look. You will see the truth because there's only one truth. And if there's only one truth, then that means that all these alternative options and realities and religions can't possibly be the truth. One of them has to be the truth. But it's the core teaching of all of them that's the truth to go within. And this is the exciting part, as I say. So who was it in history that understood that if you split the atom, you get all life? And if you can see that that there is at the very beginning of one of the biggest religious scriptures on the planet, but they never tell you that, then that can open up your mind to the fact that we haven't got a clue about human history. We don't know who was here. We don't know where they were from. Okay. Bye, guys. Children lose it, and all the children lose it.